Good day, Grade 12s. It's my privilege to be able to give to you Chapter eight, uh, 6 sorry, on Maintenance Specific on Automotive Mechanics. And so we'll be covering a number of items today. Namely the gas analyzer, compression tester, cylinder leakage, and the various pressure uh, testers. Alright, so we're going to start off with the gas analyzer today. Alright, uh, the gas analyzer, as you can see in front of you, this here is a unit that, uh, oops, have a, have a look. okay, so it, it's a unit that basically um, the pipe goes into the exhaust of the motor car and the car has to be at operating temperature and so it will be picking up the exhaust gases on the motor car and actually analyzing them. So you can actually pick up, especially on the older cars, if the mixture was too rich, um, at various speeds, at idle or at various speeds, you can actually adjust them. On the new cars, that is not possible. So if it is rich, it means there's a sensor or something wrong on the new cars because they are all electronically controlled by an ECU, electronic control unit. However, so we're going to go through the actual steps on how to set up the gas analyzer. So let's go forward. So there, that's what it looks like, all right? The pipe um, basically is the one that goes in the exhaust. You need to make sure it's clean and the filters are clean and it needs to be set up, all right? So let's go a bit further. All right, safety requirements while setting up equipment. The inlet hose must not be stepped on or restricted in any way because obviously that will stop the gases from coming into the gas analyzer. The hose connections must be airtight and the valve on the condenser in the horizontal position closed. The vehicle being tested should have no leaks in the exhaust, manifold or vacuum systems. This problem will result in the analyzer giving a lean reading or no reading at all. If you are unsure, test the analyzer on another good vehicle. So yeah, um, if you know your car's exhaust is leaking, it is no use putting the gas analyzer on it because you're going to get a false reading, you're not going to get the correct readings. From time to time, condense it, which is basically the water particles that uh, come through from the exhaust, must be blown out of the hoses and picked up probe with compressed air. The hoses must be disconnected from the analyzer or the pump will be damaged. The condenser, that's once again the water droplets, must be drained after each test using the valve. When the paper filter becomes light grey it should be changed now just to show you the actual paper filter I've got one here in a bank packet I've taken out of this analyzer here, the gas analyzer and it became very dirty and so I replaced it okay so we we, we uh, so yes light grey it should be changed take care when inserting filter paper into the housing ensure that the window is properly located before hang tightening the large nut. The fuel filter on the condensed stand must be changed regularly on a 12 volt analyzer. The battery clamp must be clean. Okay, uh, that is the type of analyzer that you'd actually uh, put the two wires on the actual battery terminals of the battery in the motor car in the engine compartment to actually make the analyzer work. All right. Um, Operating instructions. Connect the analyzer to the 12 volt battery terminals. Polarity need, needs to be observed. Okay, so in other words, there's normally a, a red clamp on the one side, crocodile clamp, and the other side will be black, and so the red always goes to positive and the black goes to negative. The LCD will display 00, zero during the 30 second preheat period and will go through the auto zero self-test program for 30 seconds until zero zero is displayed. Now on this unit here, I've already had set it up and it's already on zero zero in the front if you have a look. Okay. Uh, do not connect the armored hose from the condensed pipe to the rear of the machine until the display is on zero point zero zero. Insert the silicon hose probe and clamp into the exhaust tailpipe with a stand to the right of or left of the exhaust fumes to prevent the heat affecting the stand. Enroll the armored hose and push it onto the brass inlet at the back of the analyzer. 
observe the following readings on the display and make adjustments according to the vehicle manufacturer specifications. All right, so that's basically going through how to operate it. Let's go further. Interpreting the results. Okay, so this is a table in your books on page 100. Okay, and 101. High uh, carbon monoxide reading, too rich a mixture. Ignition misfiring, so it could be the spark plugs or the spark plug wires. Dirty restricted air filter, but that's a big one. If the air filter is very dirty, it definitely can cause a rich mixture. And obviously, the corrective measure is to replace the air filter. Improper operating of the fuel delivery system. So there's a problem with the fuel delivery system. Maybe the injectors are maybe damaged or faulty through high mileage, or maybe some dirt has got into them uh, through the fuel filter. Faulty thermostats or coolant sensors. This is a big one on motor cars. So on a motor car, we have got sensors that pick up what the temperature of the actual engine is and of what the actual cooling system, the, the coolant, what temperature it is. And sometimes they give the wrong value. And because they give the wrong value, the car could be actually be actually hot and operating temperature, but it gives the wrong value and saying that the car is still cool. And so then it actually starts injecting too much petrol. So this is a big fault that we found on many, many vehicles when they start getting heavy on fuel. Um, Non-functioning PC valve system, catalytic converter not working. On all the main new cars, we have got catalytic converters, and so they become clogged, especially if the engine becomes old and is using oil. It actually coats the actual ceramic inside the catalytic converter, and so therefore it no longer works properly, and therefore you get the wrong reading that's been sent to the lambda sensors. Low carbon monoxide reading. Normal reading for CO, all systems operating with intolerance. Okay, so we'll go up to the next slide. High uh, oxygen O2 reading. Two liter air fuel ratio, ignition problems, vacuum leaks, catalytic converter not working once again. And there you can see the corrective me measures, reset fuel mixture. Okay, uh, check the reset ignition uh, system, repair vacuum leaks, check and repair, okay, on the catalytic converter, so it needs to be replaced. And just for your information, catalytic converters are actually not cheap, they're looking at about 10,000 Rand, depending on which vehicle you're looking at. If it's Mercedes-Benz, it could be anything from 20 to 30,000 to replace one. Alright, and also on the lean mixture ratio, often there could be a leak on the inlet manifold, a lot of the new cars, the inlet manifold is made out of plastic, Okay, and so that plastic can sometimes warp and then there's not a, a good seal between the actual inlet manifold and the cylinder head and it can actually uh, suck air in and then that air is not actually going through the actual um, air flow meter and so the ECU is getting the wrong readings and actually it's getting more air to the engine than what the ECU actually realizes and that's what can cause a lean mixture. Alright, let's go to the next one. Low oxygen O2 reading. Too rich a fuel mixture, reset fuel mixture. High carbon dioxide reading. Nearly ideal air fuel mixture. All systems operating with intolerance. Low carbon dioxide reading. Fuel mixture either too rich or too lean. Exhaust system leaks. Okay, so there once again, um, if the exhaust system is leaking, you're not going to get an accurate reading on your um, gas analyzer. Okay, so there are the corrective measures to reset fuel mixture, check and repair exhaust system. Okay, we're going on. So the NOx reading, high NOx reading, lean fuel mixture once again, improper spark plug advance, malfunctioning EGR. Okay, um, EGR is fitted to the most of the very latest cars. Okay, um, and so they actually reburn some of the gases going out of the exhaust, going into a special system, and so they can actually clog up with um, soot and that type of thing. Okay, so check and replace EGR valve. Malfunctioning catalytic converter once again, that's the exhaust system, check and replace catalytic converter. High carbon HC reading, okay, excessive unburned fuel by the incomplete combustion. 
preset fuel mixture, that's if you can. A lot of the new cars, as I've said, you cannot actually reset the fuel mixture as they are uh, basically embedded into the ECU. And so it's the ECU is uh, um, basically, yeah, it actually uh, relies on all the information from the different sensors in the engine to be able to see how much fuel it should actually be injecting at that point in time depending on the engine load and how fast you're going and if you're going downhill or uphill. Alright, improper timing, check and reset ignition systems, vacuum leak, check and repair vacuum leaks which are also once again can be a little pipe or can be inlet manifold. Faulty air management system, check and repair. Low carbon, hydrocarbon uh, AC reading, normal reading, all systems operating with intolerance. Okay, then these are some of the malfunctions that you can get, that you get an error code actually on the gas analyzer. Uh, this year, I would, the preheat is important for you to know, the triple zero that must come on, but the other actual errors, I do not think that you get any of those asked in an exam. Okay, manufacturer specifications. The following specs must be obtained from the manufacturer. Percentage of the following gases allowed in the outlet gas. Now, the gas analyzer that I have displayed here this morning, um, that is basically just to check your carbon monoxide uh, uh, okay, uh, readings from the exhaust. But the newest gas analyzers, actually, they check on four different um, gases coming out of the exhaust. And so you got your carbon monoxide, your carbon, uh, hydrocarbons, combination of fuel and oil vapors. So your carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and sulfur dioxide. And then the oxygen and particulate matter. All right. So the EGR normally actually, um, or the oxygen sensor picks up on that. Okay, which is also the exhaust system or the EGR system. Adjustments can be made to the engine computer system to rectify incorrect readings. Alright, this is our activities, which um, my pupils are already given to. Okay, um, These you need to do, they are in your book, on page 101 at the bottom. And so, being under lockdown circumstances, you should be doing uh, these activities at home. And that there is a very big possibility they could ask you any one of these questions in the exam uh, coming up in June or whenever it's deferred to. State four different types of gases coming out the exhaust system that are analyzed. Well, we've just, if you go back a slide here, there they are carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen uh, oxide, and sulfur dioxide. Uh, then they're asking you what would name four possible causes. Um, and the necessary corrective measures that need to be done for the following faults. And then they're giving it to you uh, 2.1 carbon monoxide reading. You can go to the table there and get your uh, what is going on. And then 2.2 hydrocarbon reading. There you once again can go to the table and you can do the following. And number three, name two possible causes and necessary corrective measures that need to be done for the following faults. High oxygen, okay, reading, O2 reading, and low carbon dioxide, CO2 reading. Once again, go back to your table, and it will help you through them. All right, then we're going to go to the next section on Chapter 6, which is our compression test. First of all, why would you conduct a compression test on a motor car? On a car that is not faulty, there is no reason to do a compression test. And so you're only going to do a compression test on a motor car that is either running erratically and you've checked all the um, wire leads to the coils and so forth and to the spark plugs and you know you put a new set of spark plugs in and maybe you've even checked the valve clearances on the car and so then you're going to start going to actually check a bit further on the motor car to see what is the problem. Alright, so I'm just going to just move the test out of the road real quick. Okay, 
Okay, so our compression test, okay, we actually, this is what the compression tester looks like, okay, you actually screw it into the spark plug hole of the spark of the engine, alright, so I've got a little model of an engine here, and so the spark plug would be taken out, and you would actually screw it into the spark plug hole, okay. So, um, with this gauge, it actually the gauge will give a reading, okay, after actually uh, depressing the accelerator pedal and checking that all your everything's right in the motor car, and actually cranking the engine at least five crankshaft revolutions. Okay, so let's go through step by step what actually we do. We do. Right. Um, page. 102 is basically in your books on the compression test. Alright, safety requirements while setting up equipment. Ensure that the tester can handle the pressure you want to test. Why are they actually saying that? Because there is a tester for petrol engines and there is a separate tester for diesel engines. You cannot go and use a petrol engine compression tester on a diesel engine. Okay, because the diesel engine, the compression ratio is so much higher, it is double the amount, basically, of that of a petrol engine. And so, therefore, you'd actually would damage the actual tester for the, the petrol one if you had to try and insert it in a diesel engine. Okay, clean the spark plug hole with compressed air from all dirt before you remove the spark plug. All the dirt can fall into the uh, plug hole when you remove the plug. So. Before you even take the spark plug out, you normally crack it, give it a half a turn, loose, and take an airline and blow all the dirt and rubbish away. So no, no, no dirt from, you've been driving gravel roads, and some dirt is settled around there, and you do not want that dirt to fall into the engine and top of the piston, because that's going to damage the engine when you're actually going to be using the car again. Ensure that the rubber pipes are not perished from the tester. Uh, ensure that the relief valve on the tester is working. All right. So on this side of the little tester, there is a relief valve. I'll just demonstrate to you right now. So there is a little relief valve that you press once you've actually tested cylinder number one, and you relieve the, the pressure, and you go back to cylinder number two. All right. Um, ensure that you use the right adapter for the plug hole. Uh, if it is screwed in too deep, the piston may hit it. Okay, so some cars have different size spark plugs. Some have got actually a smaller thread, some of them have got a bigger thread, some of them the actual thread is a very uh, short little thread. So if you go and screw the actual compression tester into it and you've got a long thread sticking there and now you crank in the engine and it hits the tester, you are going to damage the tester as well as possibly the engine. Ensure that the throttle is open by either pressing the accelerator or wedging the linkage open under the bonnet. If the throttle is not open, um, air cannot get into the cylinder and the reading will be far too low. So it's very vital that you actually open the throttle fully on the engine before you actually do your compression test. How to do the test? Okay, so run the engine. I've actually added this note, it's not in your book, but it's actually from one of the older books, okay? So you run the engine until it reaches normal operating temperature. Uh, when test is done on a cold engine, it is usually showing low reading. So that's the reason why we get the engine to operating temperature first. In other words, go for a drive with the car around the block, uh, or let it run for a while until you see the heat gauge in the normal position. Remove the high tension lead and take out all the spark plugs. Mark each spark plug so you know which cylinder it, it comes from. So in other words, you take them out in sequence. One, two, three, and four if it's a four cylinder engine. And you, the reason being is that you can actually go and check on the spark plug possibly which cylinder is faulty. Okay? By the actual color of the spark plug. So one might be more black than the others. So there's a possibility that that cylinder is not running properly or the spark plug is not firing properly or the, the coil there. And so you can actually determine just by looking at the spark plug that where the problem might lie in the engine. You 
ignition system must then be disabled. If this isn't done, it will continue to generate high uh, voltage in the HT leads, which will have nowhere to go with the plugs removed. These high voltage will uh, find another route to earth and can damage the ignition system or even the car's ECU. So on the older cars, it's not too much of a problem, because it's not going to really do too much damage. But on the new cars that have got all ECUs, and there's probably most cars from around about 1998 to 2000, uh, they've got an ECU on board, electronic control unit, uh, that controls everything on the motor car. Okay. And so, if you, uh, some of them are very sensitive, and so if you do not, if you have this high voltage jumping out the spark plug leads, it can actually go through the chassis of the motor car, or the body of the engine, and actually damage the ECU, because then you get getting this high surge of current going through the earth of the motor car. Unplug the low tension connections to the coil or to the distributor. Screw the gauge into cylinder number one and rest it where you can see the dial while you crank the engine. Fully open the throttle, either by pressing the accelerator or wedging the linkage open under the bonnet. Crank the engine until the gauge stops rising and count the revolutions while you do it. It should normally take no more than 10 engine revolutions, okay, about five compression strokes. To get a full reading, you can count the cycles by watching the gauge uh, as it jumps of the needle in one compression stroke. All right, next slide. Carrying on with how to do the test. Write down the final reading and make a mental note of how quickly the gauge rose in the first few cycles. Okay, that's quite important because if the gauge jumps up quickly in the first actual revolution of, of the cylinder, it means that that cylinder is normally in good condition. But if it, the gauge rises very slowly under each stroke, it means that the piston rings are probably quite worn on that cylinder or maybe there's some other problem with the valves or something like that. Make use of the release valve and release the pressure to zero. Repeat the procedure for the other three cylinders. Make sure that each cylinder reaches um, its highest reading after the same number of engine revolutions. If all readings are good, then you can finish the test there. If any of the cylinders are low, you can do a wet test. This involves squirting a few drops of oil into the cylinder and repeating the test. The oil will help seal leaking rings and increase the reading but won't solve the problem which lies in the valves of the head gasket. Alright, so basically you take an oil can, you take about, put about 5 milliliters to 10 moles in each cylinder and you do the wet test if the cylinders are more than 10% difference. In, uh, so if you get in a reading of 1000 kilopascals on three of the cylinders and one has only got 800 or 850 kilopascals that is more than 10% difference and so therefore you should be conducting the wet test and that is just to establish um, if the pressure does come up during the wet test uh, using the oil then it normally indicates the piston rings are worn. If the pressure does not come up then there's a possibility of three other places that it could be leaking and that would either be the inlet valve or the exhaust valve or the head gasket could be blown or even cracked. And the head could be cracked. Okay. Well, it's also important here to be able to do this test is get all manufacturer specifications and compare them with readings from the compression test. Okay. All right. There is interpreting our results on the worn rings, which is on page 102. Okay, and 103 in your books. An engine in good condition should have a reading in the specified range, okay, uh, preferred as the upper end of it, and with the cylinders uh, with 10% of one another. So in other words, they shouldn't vary more than 10%. If they do, then the possible cause would be worn rings and worn cylinders, a uh, high mileage vehicle, okay, and the corrective measure would be to overall the engine, which you'd need to take it to the garage, unless you're very competent yourself, uh, then you maybe could do that. If the piston rings are worn, you often see the gauge rise in small jumps of 42 to 64 kilopascals per cycle rather than one big initial jump and also take more revolutions to reach a peak reading. 
So there, once again, what would be the cause? Compression pistons and the rings are worn, okay, and the cylinders. So you probably correct to measure, once again, is overall the engine, rebore the cylinders and fit new rings and pistons. All cylinders showing similar KPA reading, but reading below the minimum figure, usually indicate excessive ring or bore wear due to high mileage. Excessive ring and bore wear due to high mileage, rebore cylinders, fit new rings and pistons. So basically, it's an engine overall. Okay, next slide. A slip cam belt can also give a similar result and very low readings can be caused by bent valves. Alright, normally if the valves are really bent, you probably won't get any reading on that cylinder because the air is escaping. Bent valves, slip cam belt, okay, possible causes, corrective measures, replace with new valves in order to take, have to take the cylinder head off the motor car, put new valves in and make sure that the cam belt is adjusted and in the correct position. Next one there, very low, but similar readings on two adjacent cylinders are often caused by a blown head gasket between these two cylinders. It's more difficult to detect and a fault if only one cylinder is a low reading. So the possible cause would be blown head gasket, replace the new gasket and skim the cylinder head before putting it back on. Why do we skim it? Because normally the head has got a warp in it, it's no longer flat and so it actually be slightly bowed and so you have to take it to engineering firm to be able to skim the head where they actually take a light cut of metal off the actual head to make it flat once again. Alright, at the bottom there, if the wet test gives a normal reading, the problem lies in the rings or balls. If not, then the valves or gasket are not seating properly. Rings and boards, okay, valves or gaskets are not seating properly. So overall the cylinder head and cut the cylinders and replace new piston and rings depending on which one it is. Okay. Sorry, for, got caught for a moment there. Activity 2. There are five safety factors that need to be applied when setting up the equipment to test the cylinder leakage of an engine. Alright, mentioned four possible faults uh, caused on the corrective measures that need to be taken to repair them when doing a compression test. Okay, so activity 2, we actually cannot, you can't do that one quite yet because I haven't done the cylinder leakage with you, which I'm going to do it now. Alright. So, we're going to take away the, oh, just to come back, the, the two different types of compression testers, the one is has got a gauge lid, and this one is the card type, the book does make a talk about a card type of um, compression tester, so there's actually a little needle that moves up, and actually makes a mark on the card, and then you actually pull it and check the next cylinder, and uh, so this one you just maybe push the top of the spark plug a hole, right. Right, we're going to go back now to uh, some of the leakage. Okay, for a moment. Okay, so the leakage is on page 103 in your books. And let's go there. Alright, so we're going to go look at this in the leakage tester. Alright, so now you've done the compression test. If all the cylinders were good, in good condition and the, you would not need to do the cylinder leakage test. The cylinder leakage test is basically more specific than the actual compression test. Okay, So if you have got a low reading one cylinder or maybe two cylinders, you now can actually do the cylinder leakage test and it will actually now more pinpoint what the problem is. Uh, you're not going to be guessing if it's the valves or the piston rings. But now you'll actually find out which one it actually is. Okay, so let's go through the process. Um, safety and pre-checks while setting up equipment. Ensure the vehicle is at normal operating temperature, once again, so that you get the correct readings. Okay, and everything is, is in, has expanded, all the metal is expanded to the right sizes. Okay, so that you basically can 
uh, will minimize the actual cylinder leakage, especially past the rings. Remove the following engine components, the air filter, high tension spark plug leads, the oil cap, um, or the dipstick, and the radiator cap. Be careful when removing the radiator cap when the engine is hot. What is hot and under pressure. So that's quite a dangerous thing to do if the car is really, really hot, to remove the radiator cap, because if the water is boiling and above 100 degrees Celsius, it's going to shoot out there, and there's a possibility of you getting burnt. So be very careful when taking the radiator cap off. Top up the water level in the radiator or the expansion bottle. Okay, the reason why you're doing that is, is that once you put the air pressure on the cylinder, which I'll explain now, you will see some bubbles going through the unit, then you know it's the head gasket blown. So you need to fill up the radiator so you can actually see those bubbles coming through. Unscrew the spark plugs, clean the holes first or dirt, can fall into the spark plug hole. Same thing as on the uh, compression test. You want to make sure it's clean around the spark plugs and no dirt goes into the cylinders and does further damage to your engine. Turn engine till both valves in the cylinder closed uh, on number one. Uh, piston is on the power stroke. Okay, I'm going to just demonstrate to you on my little model here. So basically, you want to basically turn the engine. There is the exhaust valve actually opening and closing and then the inlet valve is going to open and close and now they're both closed and the piston is on top dead center and then that would be where you want it to be. Both valves must be in the closed position before you insert the adapter pipe into the spark plug hole. All right. Okay, so let's carry on. Turn the engine until both valves are closed, which I've just demonstrated to you. Screw the, uh, the cylinder connecting hose with a spark plug adapter into cylinder number one spark plug hole. Make sure that it is right adapter for the engine. Once again, I mentioned to you there in the compression test that various cars, some of them have different size spark plugs. So you need to make sure you've got the right adapter for the vehicle that you're working on. Use a spanner to lock the crankshaft pulley so they cannot turn. All right. So that is when you're actually putting the pressure on top of the actual piston or from an air line, okay, you're actually going to use a compressor with the air line and pushing actual air on top of the piston. So that is to prevent the crankshaft from turning. But however, if you've got that piston exactly on top dead center, it should not actually be able to turn the crankshaft. Last point there on the slide, couple the compressed air pump from the compressor to the tester main supply. Okay. Cylinder leakage tester. Safety checks and pre-checks while testing that equipment. Turn the regulator while the cylinder uh, without the, uh, the cylinder test hose connected until the percentage gauge reads zero. Connect the cylinder tester hose to the cylinder leakage tester. On the relief valve, on the tester slowly uh, check the leakage reading. Repeat on all cylinders before following the firing order. Check the manufacturer specifications to, to determine the maximum amount of gas leakage that is permissible. Now you'll see in your books, the cylinder leakage tester is basically in a box with a gauge. The one that I've got here this morning that I've actually, um, is, looks a bit different, but it, look, it does exactly the same thing. So they come in various shapes and sizes. Manufacturer specifications. Determine the cause of the leakage. Listen at the intake. So now you've actually set the whole thing up and you've actually basically applied air pressure. Okay, so just going to demonstrate you. So you've got your adapter part plugged into the spark plug hole. Cylinders on top dead center. The adapter pipe here, all right, would be fitted to the cylinder leakage tester. Okay and there would be an air pipe and compressed air actually coming in here and you'd actually get a reading on the actual gauge alright so now you're going to be the air is pushed into the engine and you're going to be going to listening listening to the various places where it could be leaking so you listen at the air intake okay that's on the older car where the carburetor is on the newer cars basically where the air filter is okay on the inlet manifold and if you hear a 
leaky noise there, a hissing noise as we call it, then the inlet valve is leaking. Listen at the exhaust pipe valve for hissing noise, so you go to the actual rear of the car, listen at the ex actual exhaust, and if there's a hissing noise there, then we know that the exhaust valve is leaking. Listen for hissing noise at the dipstick hole, okay, so then we know that the piston rings are basically letting air past and they are warm. Alright, remove the filler cap on the tapper cover, okay, that's where you fill, uh, put oil in, in the engine, that's the filler cap, alright, um, and listen for hissing noise there and once again the piston rings will be worn if there is air coming out there. And Next one, if you see bubbles in the radiator water, remember we had to fill up the radiator to, to right to the top, okay? Um, and so if there are bubbles coming out there, it means that the heat gasket is blown or the cylinder block is cracked. If you see bubbles in the radiator water or expansion tank, the cylinder gasket is blown, the cylinder head is cracked or the cylinder block is cracked, okay? So basically there are five different places to check. These two year are basically a duplicate of each other. Alright. Interpreting the results on the cylinder leakage test. Alright. Hissing noise at the air intake, we've already mentioned it. Uh, so it's a leaking inlet valve, so you'd have to take the cylinder head off and actually either replace the inlet valve that is maybe burnt or damaged and then the new one needs to be inserted and lapped in. Alright, so it seals properly. Hissing noise at the exhaust pipe, once again, the head would have to, cylinder head would have to come off, and it's a leaking exhaust valve, replace or reseat, uh, and put a new exhaust valve in and obviously reseat it so it actually closes properly. Hissing noise at the dipstick or oil filler cap, okay, so basically those would be much the same places, the piston rings are worn all the cylinders so you'd have to have a whole engine overall where you put a new set of pistons in or a new set of rings in whichever whatever depending on how badly the engine is worn okay and then number four bubbling in the radiator water okay so if you see bubbles in the radiator water blown cylinder head gaskets or crack cylinder block and so you'd have to now take the cylinder head off and have it pressure tested and if it's not cracked, well good for you, then we just have it skimmed and put a new head gasket on and it uh, should solve the problem. Skim the cylinder head and replace the head gasket or cylinder block. Activities there, start how you would set up the equipment to test the cylinder leakage on the engine. We've just gone through that, you can answer that. that um, the actual setting up of the, and actually doing the actual test on cylinder leakage and the compression test uh, are definitely one of those you would very much get in the exam. Alright, so that are coming up. Mention four possible faults, the possible causes and the corrective measures that need to be taken to repair them when doing a cylinder leakage test. Okay, so that is activity three. Alright, then we're going to go up to the next one. Maintenance, pressure testing. Okay, now there's a number of places where the pressure testing leak gets taken. We're looking at the oil pressure, we're looking at the fuel pressure, and we're also looking at the radiator pressure to make sure there's no leaks in the radiator system or the radiator uh, pressure cap itself. So there we're going to start with the oil pressure test. Um, I actually unfortunately do not have a oil pressure tester with me today, uh, but yes, uh, what I do have is the oil sender unit okay so the oil sender unit <laughs> you'd actually take an oil sender unit out okay on the motor car and you'd actually connect a little pipe with a gauge up to the actual cylinder block where the oil sender unit comes out and then you'd actually run the engine to check what pressure the actual um, oil pump is being uh, is actually pushing into the engine all right and uh, so why are we checking the oil pressure well the oil pressure is vital in an engine you need to be able to get lubrication to all the working parts of the engine namely the crankshaft 
the connecting rods, so the big ends, main bearings, the camshaft and all the valves need to be lubricated. All right, so if you don't have a good lubrication engine, it's a very good possibility that you could run bearings. And as a common name is, what people say the engine is knocking, that is when the uh, bearing is run because of lack of oil. Okay, and that could be a lack of oil pressure. So let's go look through here. Oil pressure tested. Safety requirements. Okay, let's just tell you what page that is on in your book. And that is on page 105 in your book. Safety requirements while testing up, uh, setting up equipment. Ensure that the tester can read the pressure of the engine. Ensure that the place where you will couple the tester is clean before you remove the oil sender unit. That little piece I just showed you, that is an oil sender unit. Ensure that the rubber pipe is not perished on the tester. So that means if the tester hasn't been used for a long time, and then rubber uh, pipes do perish, especially with oil, and so make sure it's not actually damaged. Put the tester on a place on the engine that is safe for the, uh, from the running engine. So once you put the tester on and it's all connected up, you need to start the engine to actually run the engine so you can actually see what the oil pressure is while the engine is running at various speeds. Okay, so oil pressure testing uh, continued, manufacturer specifications, this is what we need. We get the following specs, specifications from the manufacturers. Oil pressure while the engine is idling. Okay, very important. While the engine is idling, what is the oil pressure? Now, the older cars actually had an oil pressure gauge where you could actually see the actual pressure while the engine was idling and when the engine was going faster, okay, when the revs increase. But most new cars do not have that. All that they've got is a light in the car. Sometimes it shows as a little oil light on the car, uh, like an oil can, okay, in red in the background. And so normally that um, light will come on. If that oil light comes on while you're driving the car, the recommendation is that you stop the car immediately. Otherwise, you're going to damage the engine and actually that can co uh, cause um, a lot of damage in the engine and co uh, cost you a lot of money. If it's a cheap little car like a Golf, we're looking at about 20,000 Rand if you take it to the garage for to overall the engine. If it's something like a Mercedes engine, you're looking at about 80,000 Rand. So, the, to stop your, uh, prevent yourself from actually having to have a, a, a big bull on repairing the engine, when the oil light comes on, do yourself a favor, stop the engine immediately. And maybe you can solve the problem without major costs. All right, so oil pressure when the engine is idling, oil pressure when the engine is cold, oil pressure when the engine is hot, oil pressure on high revolutions. Compare the above readings to your findings and determine what the fault can be. Example, a worn oil pump, leaking oil or dirty oil. Okay, And obviously the oil filter could also be restricting maybe the, the flow of the oil. Alright, uh, interpreting the results here, oil pressure too low, the, the possible causes, worn oil pump, so what would the corrective measure be? Replace with a new oil pump. Um, on the Golfs and Jettas, uh, the older ones, it is very easy. You can actually remove the sump in place, remove the oil filter, uh, the pump, put a new one in, put a new oil filter on, and new fresh oil in the engine, and your problem is solved. But on the new cars, it's not always so easy. You, some of the cars, you cannot take the sump off in place, and so it's a bit more lengthy process, but it is still a lot better than actually having to replace the whole engine or overall the whole engine because you carry on driving the car with the oil light on, which is not wise. Okay, blocked oil pump screen in sump. So sometimes there's a, there's a pickup pipe inside the sump of the motor car engine and it becomes blocked with dirt. Okay, sometimes if the engine has been overhauled, the guys have used a lot of silicon sealer and those little pieces of silicon sealer have come loose and are actually blocking the sieve on the actual pickup pipe and can actually starve the engine of um, oil and therefore run bearings in the, on the main uh, on the crankshaft and main bearings, the big end bearings. Remove the sump, check and clean the, uh, the screen, the little sieve. Worn main big end and camshaft bearings. 
overhaul the engine, replace the bearings. So once your bearings are worn and the, you're not getting oil pressure because of that reason, the oil pump's in good shape and everything else, then you need to overhaul the engine. Okay, normally it's done hard mining to that stage. Blocked or restricted oil filter, renew the oil filter. It's a nice simple one that you want to put new oil in. Dirty or contaminated oil, change the oil. Oil leaks, replace the defective gaskets. In other words, oil I might come on because the oil level has got low because there's a severe leak on the car, which happens now and again. All right. And some cars, some people drive them with oil leaks, and eventually you need to keep on topping up the oil. Too little oil in the engine, top up oil level. Okay, now another thing that can cause the oil to get low in the engine is that the actual oil rings are damaged to the engine and so it actually burns some of the oil while the engine is running. And so that can cause the engine oil to disappear. Alright, you might have no leaks in the engine whatsoever, but it's actually burning some of the oil going past the oil rings and being burnt with a petrol and air mixture. Correct grade viscosity oil, too thin, ensure that the correct oil according to the manufacturer specifications are used. So what are we talking about viscosity? On the actual uh, oil can, you'll see a different grading, it's 20W50 or a 15W40. And so the older cars, a 20W50 is fine to use in older cars. However, on the newer cars from about 2010 onwards, I would recommend that you make sure that you know what oil you're putting in the vehicle. All right, uh, because often there are sometimes even a 5W30, and the 5W30 is a very very thin oil, and normally it is a synthetic oil as well. And so the price difference in the synthetic oil and a normal oil of 20W50, you're probably looking at one being costing around 200 to 250 rand for five liters where the synthetic oil is probably uh, closer to 500 rand, 4 to 500 rand for 5 liters of oil. Okay, defective oil pressure relief valve. Okay, so in the oil pump, when the oil pressure becomes too high, there's a little valve, normally a ball and spring, or a little plunger, and sometimes with over time and the oil being dirty, not being changed regular, this can actually stick, and they can also give you a low oil pressure oil pressure. So you would re normally replace the valve or replace the oil filter. I mean the whole oil pump, sorry. Okay, oil pressure tester in interpreting results continued. Oil pressure too high. Okay, this is, that one was too low. Blocked oil passages. Okay, uh, so the only way to sort it out is overall the engine, clean out the oil passages. Uh, too little clearance on main and, and big end bearings and camshaft bearings, okay. That is possible if the engine has been overhauled and you've not actually got the right clearances on the actual bearings. Uh, so they once again would cause you to, that's not gonna, if the car's been running for some time, the clearances are not gonna get smaller. They are going to get bigger. So if it is small, it means it's been small from the start and there's obviously an issue with the engine. Overall, the engine replace these bearings, ensure that the clearance is in according to the specifications. Dirty or contaminated oil, change the oil, very easy. Incorrect grade, viscosity of the oil is too thick. In other words, using a 20W50 and the oil should be a 5W30. So therefore, you are using the incorrect oil in the new vehicle. And that actually happens these days with the new vehicles. The guy's going to use 20W50 and think it's quite fine. And meantime, the car specifications are requiring a 5W30 well. Okay. Defective pressure relief valve, which we mentioned before. So maybe the relief valve is actually not releasing the oil. And so therefore, relieve the, uh, renew the uh, relief valve. Okay. So let's go next. Look next. Next one is the fuel pump pressure. Okay, fuel pump pressure, why do we need this? First of all, on the new cars, the fuel pump pressure is really very, very high. Uh, and we're looking at um, a couple bars pressure. You can go up to almost 200 bars of pressure on the, fuel, uh, on the new cars that run with ECUs. Okay, on the older cars with carburetors, the fuel pump pressure does not have to be that high. 
Okay, so I will show you a fuel pump pressure tester. Um, but this is a very old one, it's probably about 30 years old, and so it is for older cars with carburetors. Okay, so I've got two different testers here, but both of them you would actually connect to the fuel line or the fuel pump and actually test what and actually run the engine and see what the fuel pressure is in the actual fuel pump. Alright, but this is for old models of cars, so the newer gauges would be a bit different. On the new cars, the most of the common rail is actually a place where you can actually screw the pressure, oil pressure, I mean, not oil pressure tester, sorry, getting myself mixed up here, uh, the fuel pressure tester onto the actual valve and while the car is running and then you can actually check the fuel pump pressure. So let's go over how we do this. All right, fuel pump pressure tester. This is on page 106 in the box if you're following. All right, once again, safety requirements for, while testing equipment. Ensure that the tester can read the pressure of the engine. All right, so you can't go and use the old style um, pressure testers that I've just shown you on the new engines because the fuel pressure is so much higher okay and they can go right up to something like 200 bars of pressure guys your tire of your motor car takes two bars okay um pressure now we're talking about 200 bars of pressure and maybe even up to 250 all right so that pressure of that fuel is very very high so you need the correct equipment Alright, ensure that the, the place where you will couple the test is clean before you remove the sender unit. Okay? Use the right adapter for the engine. Ensure the rubber pipes is not perished on the tester, especially on the new cars. Guys, you cannot afford, I'm sure that it will not just be a pure rubber pipe, but it will actually have um, some uh, wire mesh around it. This will be a reinforced pipe because of the pressure of 200 kilopascals. Put the tester on the place on the engine that is safe for the running of the engine. Ensure the pressure relief valve is working properly. All right, there you can see in the picture, on, it is showing you the actual uh, connecting pipe, and there are different adapters for the different vehicles, and the gauge which you will be able to go and actually see what, uh, what the fuel pressure is on the car, and compare it with the manufacturer specifications, to make, see if the actual fuel pressure is correct, or if it's too low, or too high, or what is actually going on. Get the following specifications from the manufacturers. Fuel pressure before the fuel pump. Fuel pressure before and after the injector pump. Fuel pressure when the engine is idling. Fuel pressure on high revolutions. Okay, so obviously the higher the revolution to the motor car, the more fuel it is needing, and so the pressure probably be increased quite a lot from the fuel pump at that point in time. Compare the above readings to your findings and determine what the faults can be. Okay, so there is our fuel pressure tester interpreting our results once again. Fuel pressure too low, it can be a faulty fuel pump, blocked or restricted fuel filter, cracked or restricted fuel line. Okay, so you can have a fuel pump that's got a little crack in it and it's leaking. Okay, and so what do we do then? First of all, the fuel uh, pump uh, faulty, test and replace the fuel pump, renew the fuel faulty if it's blocked or restricted, and if the pipe is uh, cracked, renew or disconnect and blow out the fuel lines. Clog pump in that strainer, okay, so there's a, a lot of the new cars, the actual fuel pump is actually in the fuel tank, and there's a little strainer there, so maybe you've got some dirty fuel from the the garage for some reason and picked up some dirt and so you move the pump from the tank and clean the strainer. Low voltage of the fuel pump. Check and connect voltage to the pump. Okay, so you need to go and check the actual um, current uh, being supplied to the pump. If it's um, too low, then obviously the fuel pump's not going to work. Faulty or failed fuel pressure regulator. Test and renew fuel pressure regulator. Defective fuel pump relay. Test and replace relay. Okay, so the relays can actually give problems on uh, they do on numerous cars. 
no legal Opal uh, cadets and cars and backies. The re uh, relay sometimes has to be replaced, and once you replace them, then you've got no problem once again. Empty fuel tank, fill the tank. Okay, so obviously if the tank is empty, you've run out of fuel, uh, you're not going to have any fuel. You're going to have low fuel pressure or no fuel pressure at all. Fill the tank up with some direct petrol. That's just, a, that's just an obvious one. All right. That's a no-brainer, as they say. Fuel pressure too high. Restriction in the return fuel line. So from the actual common rail that I mentioned at the injectors of the motor car, uh, if the pressure is too high there, there's normally a return pipe with a small, slightly thinner pipe that goes back to the fuel tank, putting petrol back into the petrol tank that is not actually because the pressure is too much. So sometimes uh, you might have a problem there with the restriction of the fuel line. Check the return fuel line for any uh, kinks or restrictions. So it might be maybe you've driven over a bad road because these petrol pipes do not go inside the car because in case there's a fire inside the car cabin where you are uh, strapped in so these fuel pipes are actually under the car. Faulty fuel pressure regulator test and renew fuel pressure regulator. Okay. Cooling system pressure tests. Okay, so we are going to go to the next testing method. All right. This is checking our radiator on the motor car. Okay. Sorry, I'm just getting some equipment out so I can show it to you guys. Okay. On the actual um, cars that we're talking about, uh, this is now on page 107 in your books, okay? We're looking at the cooling system on the motor car. That is your radiator and your pressure cap and that type of thing. So once again, if your car is not losing any water and the water levels are the right and the temperature gauge is uh, normal you don't have to do a cooling test but uh, there is a possibility if you take the car for a normal service there are sometimes they actually go and check the cooling system to make sure there are no leaks so how do we do this let's go and have a look safety requirements while setting up equipment a pressure test is used to quickly locate leaks so in other words if your car is losing water and uh, you go to the garage if you don't check the water level yourself and the guy tells you that there's no water in the actual expansion tank then you need to be a bit concerned because they can actually damage your engine and as i said earlier depending on what motor car it is if it's a mercedes-benz you're looking at around about 80,000 rand to overall the engine if it's maybe a little golf you take the grant you're looking at around about 20,000 to 30,000 rand mark to repair the motor and overall it so once again if the uh, a light comes on or your um, your pressure, no, not the pressure, I'm getting mixed up here. The actually temperature on the car rises and it goes into the red. Once again, stop the motor car, do not carry on driving because it's telling you there's a problem on the motor car and it is overheating, and that can be a very expensive repair if you carry on driving. But we're checking the cooling system, which, is, which actually controls the temperature of the engine. So let's go. Pressure testing is used to quickly locate leaks, as I've actually mentioned, do not put more pressure on the system than indicated by the manufacturer. So normally, you can actually check on the radiator cap, it will give you what the pressure it can handle on there, okay, and so normally it's about a 1 kilopascal, okay, and not uh, 1 bar pressure, okay, and so then you're about to check the um, Okay, so yeah, so we new belt to check and actually carry on. Okay, so the coolant to pour in, let's carry on back to the notes. Okay, air at low pressure is forced into the system through the radiator filler opening. This usually causes the coolant to pour or drip from the leak. Do not open the radiator cap when the engine is hot, you can get burnt. I mentioned that earlier when we actually did the cylinder leakage test. The pressure is applied by a hand operated air pump which is one of the most common and useful cooling system testing devices. 
Here is a head pump. I will just display quickly to you. So yeah, we put this on the radio test and we basically pump it here and we check the pressure up and go and check what we're looking at in the pressure. Um, to drop the pump, uh, do not drop the pump as you may damage it, okay? This has got a nice gauge on there and that type of thing. Do not put more pressure on the radio cap when tested as you may damage the valve in the cap. Right. Cooling system pressure test, manufacturer specifications, get the following specs from the manufacturer. Coolant is a ratio combination of antifreeze and water. Okay, normally you can mix it 50-50, 50% /50, 50 antifreeze and 50% water, but you can go slightly stronger than that. And in particularly if you're going to areas that are very cold and you do not want the water to freeze inside the radiator. Okay. Pressure allowed in the radiator, pressure on the radiator cap, reading the water coolant temperature. Okay. Radiator cap uh, pressure test. Alright, so you've tested your pressure on the actual radiator, now you're going to test the actual cap to see if it's faulty. You couldn't see any leaks on the, on the actual system, there were no leaks in the radiator or the, or the water pipes. Now you check in the cap to see if it actually can hold the pressure. Radiator cap pressure test means the cap's opening pressure and checks the condition of the ceiling washers. To perform this test, install the cap on the cooling system pressure tester. Uh, now pump up the tester while watching the pressure gauge. The pressure cap should release the air at the rate pressure stamped on the cap and should hold that pressure for at least one minute. Uh, if not, install a new cap. Ready to cap pressure test interpreting results. Pressure drops on the tester at the ra uh, radiator or expansion tank. Coolant leaks at the following components. Between components of the cooling system, um, remove the gasket or seal. All right. Um, renew the faulty water hose and should secure clamps, water hoses. Uh, okay. And the other one is sk skim the cylinder and replace. That's if you use any water. Um, that's with a blown head gasket, okay? Um, renew the water pump, okay, if the water pump is faulty. So, radiator, uh, renew the radiator itself. Corroded Welsh or uh, core plugs, renew the uh, Welsh or core plugs. Interior heating radiator, radiator, so inside the car, there's a little radiator that is to, in cold conditions, that makes it nice and hot inside the interior of the car. Often those leak, there are two little pipes that normally lead into the actual cabin of the car with the radiator where the air goes through it and they often leak. And so then you're going to wet carpet normally on the passenger side of the car and a funny smell in the car because of the antifreeze. And so then that would have to be replaced. And then the heat, heater tap as well can get faulty uh, or leak there. All right, so that's the actual thing where you, when you actually inside the cart and turn the actual heat on. There's a special little uh, lever you push on the car and then that tap can actually leak. Pressure drops on the tester at the radiator cap. Faulty radiator cap, renew the radiator cap. All right. And there's your activity four, which we're almost finished now. <coughs> Mention the two possible uh, faults or, or four possible causes and the corrective measures that need to be taken. And there they were basically on the t uh, table that we've just been on. Okay, so you can actually have a look there. And that table in your books is on page 108. Alright, and then you can name three different manufacturer specifications that need to be uh, when doing a fuel pressure test uh, that you can look up. Give five possible causes and the corrective measures that are needed to repair the fuel pressure that is too low. Okay, so that is also on the table there under fuel pressure. Mention four possible components where the coolant could leak when using the cooling system, uh, system pressure test. So all the above uh, are in your books, you can look up the answers. And so, yes, uh, I hope that this has been informative for you and that you will uh, find this helpful during the lockdown period. Thank you, Matrix. Good afternoon to you.